afternoon in, in Europe, good morning or good night in some other places. Uh, it's a big pleasure to, to be here with you, um, Dr. Robert Skov, who is a present education officer of ESMIT, a member of the ESMIT committee, and myself, I'm Jesus Rodriguez Baño, past president of ESMIT, will chair this session. Um, as you know, the fireplace session is an opportunity to be in direct contact with one of our uh, experts and Dr. Hayes Jesus Getahun was so kind to accept participating in this activity. As you know, uh, Dr. Getahun is at present the director of the Department of Global Coordination and Partnership on Antimicrobial Resistance for the World Health Organization. Uh, you probably are aware that ESCMIT is committed to collaborate with WHO in all the initiatives in general, but in particular now also in this one related to antimicrobial stewardship and antimicrobial resistance worldwide. And therefore, we invited Dr. Ketahun for a keynote lecture that was uh, very well attended and it was very interesting. And now we all have the opportunity to make him any question that we may have. So uh, please feel free to, to do whatever question you, you want to make, either in Word or you can also use the chat uh, for any reason. And here we go. I don't know if, if Robert, Robert, do you want to uh, introduce anything? No, it's it just to say that it's a very big pleasure that you will join this session here, Dr. Ketahun, and we all look forward to this one here. So, so please, to the audience. Okay. So, Dr. Ketahun, any any starting point from your side? No, I, I think that. Thank you very much. So, maybe to uh, kick start, you know, what was the preparation and the rationale behind, you know, the lecture. It's also, uh, you know, building on my uh, personal experience, you know, before uh, coming and start working on antimicrobial resistance, I was uh, working on uh, uh, tuberculosis and HIV, and particularly in, you know, advancing for a public health approach uh, for both, you know, areas, and also in ensuring that you know new you know uh, public health uh, interventions uh, are developed and scaled up at a global scale. And uh, one one particular example is uh, you know the WHO policy uh, on TBHIV collaborative TBHIV uh, activities, uh, which I had the privilege you know to you know develop in two thousand three. Uh, which actually now is a global you know, policy because it was a package, uh, because it was evidence-based uh, interventions now um, being implemented uh, in more than 200 you know, countries and actually saving, saving lives. But when we initially start uh, developing the TBHIV policy, we call it interim TBHIV policy because we call it interim, the evidence was not optimal. The, there was no all you know, uh, uh, evidence to support, so, but we, we also included, for example, uh, advocating or you know, some, uh, HIV testing for TB patients during those days was a very controversial you know, uh, issue because of the stigma and this and that. But we, we didn't also have evidence to really concretely say, you know, HIV testing for TB patients in high HIV setting will be helpful. But that is exactly why we put it as an interim, because the experts, they believe HIV testing would help for TB patients, but we couldn't generate the evidence at that time. So I think probably the analogy here is also for some of the issues uh, what we included in this stewardship policy will, will also be similar. So it doesn't mean that we, you know, we shouldn't generate concomitantly you know, the evidence about each and every of these activities, but at the same time, we need to acknowledge that you know, they are uh, going to make you know, solutions. They are going to make uh, you know, impact in our approach. So that's like an introduction issue. Thank you very much. So this is very much open for general questions, whatever comments you may have, please come on, don't be shy. Any any comments, any suggestions, any issue? Kansu, hello. hello. 
Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to bring us together, one of the professionals in this field. I'm John Suchiman, uh, an infectious diseases physician, and I'm doing uh, my PhD on infection control and antibiotic resistance in Germany and in the Netherlands. And I'm mostly asking my research questions regarding the uh, hospital, yeah, the healthcare providers and their crucial role in infection prevention and control. And, uh, and, but we know uh, that the quite big part of the healthcare associated infections are due to the endogenous factors. And uh, in terms of infection prevention control strategies, this knowledge uh, brings the patient into the game, actually. And for antimicrobial uh, antibiotic prescribing, there is a huge campaign I mean, regarding public health and for the community. But what should we do to involve the, the, our patients in this management in hospital settings? Thank you. Well, thank you um, uh, very much for that question. Um, I think uh, engaging the patient and also their families uh, should be an important you know, part of our intervention and approach. But in order to do that, actually, we, we have to also start by looking how, you know, are we engaging them? How do we treat our patients? Because I, I trained as a medical doctor as well. So in, in, in our training um, in medical school, what we've been, you know, taught is first to diagnose the, the disease, right? And to provide differential diagnosis and to find you know, the treatment you know, for that diagnosis, you know, following the whole procedure. But in any, in any of this standard you know, training procedure, as far as you know, when I was uh, uh, educated, there was no mechanism actually to say can, whether the patient you know, can be considered as a partner you know, in that interaction and in that decision-making. What we normally do is, you know, considering the patient and quote and unquote as a subject, you know, for which we have the authority to diagnose and find the treatment. But having, you know, that uh, one step back and really trying to engage the patient in such a way that they will have some sort of shared responsibility. You know, it could be individual, it could be collective, it could be within the family. I think it will be critically important. And that is important, particularly for antimicrobial resistance, because antimicrobial resistance, uh, most of the interventions can be dealt with individual awareness, individual knowledge, and also understanding and commitment you know, to take action. And we have also in a broader context that we should be able to empower them. Uh, when we say empower, you know, it's not only being part of you know, that decision making, that interaction, but we have to bring them as a collective, uh, you know, individuals, you know, the patients to have some sort of organized voice. When I say organized voice, it could be if we manage to convince them, it could be about not to have over the counter cell in their community, you know, in their uh, locality, in their, you know, society. So having that organized voice would be critically important. And all these have been actually uh, tested and have been proven, particularly in HIV, when it was you know, started in the US, you know, when the, uh, there was a really no treatment and people were dying. So the gay community actually started it initially by organizing you know, themselves because they were losing their, their friends and they themselves were dying. So that has actually you know, triggered that peer peer uh, support, peer pressure, which also in, uh, impacted, you know, policy and research. And this is also true in, in, in NTV, where we started bringing, you know, patient engagement, patient involvement as a true part of the policy package. So this stewardship, you know, policy also recognized that importance that we need to engage patients and, you know, be it individually or organized in our uh, Effort. So I think, yes, it's important, but at the same time, we have to do it because it's no brainer, but equally, we need to generate the evidence. You know, what is the best way? Is it really impactful? 
What can we correct? What can we measure? So I think we need to take that into consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. More questions, comments? Uh, you may use the tool to raise your hand because we, we cannot see you all in the same screen. So if you if you see that, don't give you the word, please just shout out. More comments, more questions? Yeah, I can see. I see two hands. Uh, yes. Yeah, hello. Uh, I'm Khalid Iqbal. I'm from uh, Germany, Hamburg, and I'm doing my PhD in um, infections. And uh, my question was, uh, as we talked about patient engagement, so in the third world countries where the early detection of uh, tuberculosis is really a key to, 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 to successfully treat it and also to stop the resistance development. And um, there, due to the lack of uh, High resources and also the availability of the physicians, the community pharmacies and the pharmacists um, can be a, a, a handy option to train them and to help uh, early detection of the patients that are contacting them for fever or something like this. So my question is that um, do the WHO has policies to involve the community pharmacists or uh, the pharmacies that are available in the localities for early detection and also maybe uh, the patient management. So, uh, can, you, can you comment on that? So is that the question specific to uh, antimicrobial resistance? Is that, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I think as you rightly said, there is good evidence around engaging uh, private sector or you know, community pharmacy. I mean, the name differs from one setting to the other, from one region to the other. Uh, so let's call it, you know, uh, private sector, out, you know, outside of the public uh, sector, you know, which means not part, you know, health facilities owned and run by the government. You know, these are the private uh, pharmacists. So that's, I, I, I believe, the terminology you are trying to use. Yes. So we have good evidence uh, around malaria, around TB, around HIV in, uh, for them really to help early diagnosis and patient follow-up, you know, for completion of treatment, you know, peer support, peer, you know, pressure. And, but all those policies were actually following, you know, research. It wasn't, you know, a no-brainer intervention. I think there has been quite substantial research conducted all over the world. And I was also fortunately, part, you know, a part of in the early 2000s, for a global you know, WHO community care you know, research project uh, on tuberculosis that really looked at, into the uh, role of you know, patients, the role of uh, our community members, including you know, private uh, clinicians, private sector. So I think we need to develop that. And I strongly believe uh, there is a potential, but at the same time, we have to uh, generate you know, the evidence. Uh, uh, what is the best way and what in what parameter we need to engage with. Thank you. Okay, uh, Gloria. Hello, um, thank you for this very nice opportunity of a small group. Um, so my name is Gloria Cordova. I work as an antimicrobial resistant advisor at ICARS together with Robert. And as some of you know, ICARS works with an um, One Health approach to find solutions for the containment of antimicrobial resistance. So talking, uh, as we are talking about different stakeholders, I would like to ask Hayley, uh, what do you think is the most important challenge to really implement this uh, interdisciplinary work WHO has to engage with other with the other agencies to really deliver um, a One Health solution? Yeah, so I, I think if, um, you know, AMR is complex, you know, the addressing the antimicrobial resistance and including antimicrobial stewardship is complex because humans share antimicrobials with animals, not only also with animals, actually with plants. And I wasn't aware, actually, antibiotics are spray on plants before uh, joining AMR. 
And uh, the very first time when I was visiting Argentina and I saw that, you know, first time, you know, it was a, a shock for me. And I am pretty sure most of you, the clinicians and the ma clinical microbiologists, they, you may not be really aware that actually is happening. So that is the source of the challenge because we share uh, antibiotics, antimicrobials with humans, uh, I mean, animals and plants. So this also adds additional uh, layer of complexity because the plants and the crops and the animals are, being, uh, are using antimicrobials, antibiotics, mostly for economic interest. You know, it's for gross promotion. It could be for intensified, you know, uh, food, animal uh, food production, meat production. These are all determine the economic interest of that specific country. It, it means it is about importing and exporting meat. It is about gaining uh, additional uh, income for the country, for the government. It's about getting uh, sustainability, you know, for the farmers, for uh, those who are engaged in those, uh, you know, economic activities. So the complexity is huge. So that is exactly why we are saying no one single sector will address antimicrobial resistance. We have to work together. It's trying to address antimicrobial resistance with only one single sector means just like clapping in one hand. You won't make any, you know, uh, clapping. So that is exactly why we need to work together within the one health context by engaging everyone. And uh, when I say engaging everyone, that means we need to have shared vision. So what is the overall approach that we want to achieve? Uh, how can we address, you know, those critical uh, problems? Because at the same time, uh, having, you know, asking a farmer, don't, use antimicrobials because in the future there is a risk of developing drug resistance which may affect you or you know you nobody really thinks about you know, that because the impact of antimicrobial resistance is not instant you don't see you know people dying that you see in other you know fulminant infectious diseases you know so it's the impact is slow and it is not often visible. So I think this adds into the complexity, but at the same time, coming together, you know, all those working around that, and at least to agree that there is a need to address a certain problem called antimicrobial resistance. And the way we are addressing is by enhancing reduction in the use of antimicrobials, and also making sure antimicrobials are used, you know, uh, in a proper, a responsible and prudent manner and working together. Because uh, what we have actually advanced, you know, changed in the last three years, the discussion before was that, no, the agriculture sector doesn't want to talk about antimicrobial resistance because it is against meat export. It is against uh, economic interest. It is against food security also, you know, uh, because having antibiotics uh, in a poultry makes sure that you have good, you know, meat production, meat production is food security. So really bringing, you know, those different groups was one of our biggest achievements in the last, you know, three years, because now nobody is shy of discussing antimicrobial resistance because of economic interest, because that it will profit from me using you know, for gross promotion or this or that. So I think that uh, challenge is now being addressed. So we are bringing everyone to the table, but at the same time, what we see, including in the human health sector, which I believe most of you are representing, is it is not even strong. So while we are trying to work together, okay, to address our shared challenges, we need to make sure that we also address the sector specific problems. Because antibiotic stewardship in a hospital is none of the business of a farmer. And making sure there is good infection prevention and control in a hospital or in a clinic is none of the business of uh, 
an aquaculture uh, farm. So we need to strengthen those. And the same is also true for making sure there is what they call you know, good biosecurity, which means good infection prevention. In the farm animals, it's none of the business of uh, a doctor, an internist working in a hospital. So we have to strengthen those sector-specific responses while we are also working together. So this is also the second way yes. that we are trying to you know, address this uh, complex challenge. Thank you, very clear. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you uh, very much for this uh, opportunity. And it's uh, such a great discussion so far. Thank you very much. So I have a question uh, regarding some of the things that you have mentioned uh, so far. Um, I mean, we are talking about here too, when you mentioned how you work with HIV TB, that you really need evidence uh, and also to work as a group from different stakeholders. So my question to you, and maybe I should mention that I'm uh, uh, one of the founders and CEO of a Swedish startup company called 1928 Diagnostics. 1928 referring to the year when Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin and our scope when we started it was to save the power antibiotics. And I believe, as you say, we need different stakeholders for different from industry, from authorities, from all over the globe to collaborate. So do you have any initiatives from one health perspective where we can work together to address this challenge and really show some proof? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I think you are presenting an important, you know, area. Diagnosis, diagnosis, as I stipulated in my presentation, is, is critical. We need to have correct diagnosis. We need to have correct diagnostics, uh, you, know, you know, effective diagnostics, ready to solve the problem of um, antimicrobial resistance. And I actually very much encouraged, you know, when I really follow this year's ECMIG, you know, around diagnosis, you know, the, the potential, you know, that is coming. And which was on more or less the same case, you know, 15, 20 years uh, in, in HIV and TB, you know, uh, but resources are important and uh, massive scientific interest is important. So we need to intensify the scientific interest. You know, we need to really help all those startups, all those small, you know, uh, research attempts really to address the diagnosis issue to be supported, to be, you know, really amplified and propagated because ultimately the solution of antimicrobial resistance lies in having the proper diagnosis and diagnostic tool. There is no question, you know, about that. So coming to ba back to your question, whether there is a forum that we, we, we can work together, yes. So one of the issues that we are addressing at this point in time is that we are, again, trying to establish what we call the partnership platform uh, for antimicrobial resistance. And this was one of the requests that uh, was requested by the Interagency Coordination Group in uh, 2019 when they submitted their report to the Secretary General. We want to see, bring, you know, all the uh, stakeholders in a one health context. So as I said, in a one health context, we need to have the health sector and the animal sector, the plant sector, you know, the food sector as well. So bringing all this together and to have a shared vision, you know, if we want to reduce, you know, antibi antimicrobial use, how can we do that? How can we collaborate? So that is, something that is uh, of, you know, uh, in the making, uh, which we are hoping that we will be launching it in, uh, in, uh, in November. So I would urge you actually if, uh, you know, to follow that uh, space and make sure that you presented yourself organized because diagnosis could also help the animal sector, you know, whatever, I don't know, drug susceptibility testing, you would be able to test, would also work in the animal sector or in the food sector. So I, I think, you, 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 you know, the diagnosis could be really a, a, a cross-cutting platform. So we will look into that and uh, we will be happy to work and to collaborate with you on that. Thank you. Now we have two more questions. Uh, Anna? Hello, I'm Anna Lastro Izquierdo. Oh. 
Sorry, both of, the, both of the pending one are oh, Anna, so Anna Lastrade, thanks for it. <laughs> I'm Anna Lastrade Izquierdo, I, uh, I'm a medical mycologist and I work in the Mycology Reference Laboratory of Spain and I'm collaborating in a couple of initiatives of the WHO uh, with the antifungus and, and that's mainly my, it's a quite a general question to you, Haile, and uh, uh, just to see your, your view. And uh, I think that uh, now that anti, uh, antifungal resistance is included in the agenda of WHO and all the fungal infections are being more seen in that case, which do you think were the, are the most impactful activities that WHO can do uh, in addressing the, the rise of antifungal resistance? Because as we are always Mycology is always following uh, the steps of bacteriology, and I think that there's a lot to learn, despite being very differences between the, the, the disciplines. I think we can learn a lot from the things that have been already done. And so I would like to know what's your opinion about what are the most impactful things that we can do in the antifungal resistant world to, to, to improve the situation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Anna, and uh, thank you also for your help in the, in the fungal you know, expert group, um, uh, which uh, I, which is really important area of work for us, um, because um, uh, you, as you rightly said, you know we are learning from the bacteriology, and currently, as part of the fungal uh, work, we are doing the priority pathogen list for fungal which actually we have advertised, you know, participation into that process. And so I encourage you to go and check our website and to be part of that. We want to really make it a participatory way of, you know, defining what, which, which, which fungi are of public health importance. And once we identified those fungi of public health significance and importance, then we will follow again, following the bacteriology uh, procedure, we will look into the pipeline of diagnosis, into the pipeline of uh, treatment. Why monitoring the pipeline of diagnosis and treatment is helping? It will help us where there is need for resources. It helps us, there's a need to focus, you know, investment and also advance. And I, I, we are more than, you know, convinced. Uh, the next biggest challenge around fungi would be actually from drug resistance, you know, fungi, which we have already seen in as part of the candida aureus, you know, situation, which is now almost, you know, address covering the whole regions of the world. So for that, we have to uh, first, you know, set the standards. This is exactly what we call, you know, public health approach. First, identify which pathogens of fungi that we want to focus, and then we will look how is the uh, pipeline development for treatment? How is a pipeline development for diagnosis? And then where should we interject? Where should we put? So I think this is a, an extreme you know, part of our work. So I strongly encourage you, if you are a mycologist here, go and be part of that process. Thank you. Now, Anna McDonald, I think that we have quite time for, for that last question. Anna, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the information. That's really interesting. I'm really interested, of course, to hear about implementation. I'm part of the Panacea Consortium and currently um, leading two trials on new drugs for TB. Um, but for me, implementation um, is really, really important as a medical microbiologist. My question is, I feel that when we try to implement information, and I think that the COVID pandemic has really shown that, but AMR is a very similar topic. It's, we put a lot of weight on the importance of the voice of doctors. And yes, and scientists, all that is important, but we can see people's interests slipping away. And I think that would be AMR. And a few years ago, if I mentioned AMR, everyone was really worried. And now people say, well, we just have to live with it. And COVID is pretty much the same when you look at the press. Um, why do we send the doctors out trying to communicate? Why do we not get anthropologists, political scientists, in um, behavioralists in much earlier and much heavier and then just support them with science? That's my question. <laughs> so, 
So let me get the question. So the question is... Why, why do we not turn it around? But if we have a message, like, for example, we all could see where COVID was going and now we're exactly where we could see we are going, right? Why did we not let so, the, the communication be much more led by behavioralists and people who do that all the time? Yeah, so I think this is more of a philosophical you know, question that you know, every one of you could actually you know, respond. But from our perspective, you know, from policy uh, perspective, um, AMR has been, uh, I would say, um, a priority, but at the same time, not a priority. For example, if you look, the G20, you know, the richest countries and the G7, you know, they meet every year. The ministers of health, the minister of finance, minister of environment, agriculture, and also the president, the heads of government. If you really look and see for the last five years, what their manifesto is saying about AMR, you will find in every manifesto, in every document that AMR is mentioned. And to the extent that we need to conserve antimicrobials, we need to reduce you know, uh, infection prevention and this and that. That wasn't the case, you know, when I was working in HIV and TB. We have to push hard. We have to advocate really to mention even a single word of TB. You know, in a G7 communique or in a G7, you know, if you see this year, in this year's, because it's overshadowed by COVID, it's only a month that is mentioned, you know, in the G7 uh, manifesto. This really shows you that there is the recognition, there is the awareness, but what we are really lacking is the concrete action. So there are so many explanations for that because of the political nature of the problem. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, it deals with import-export of meat. It deals with food security. It deals with you know so many sensitive political issues. They acknowledge, they you know, recognize it, so that's why they put it in their manifesto. But when it really comes to the actual action, it is very difficult. And because of the lack of clarity and determination in politics, if you go back and see what happens in HIV TB, you know, even in maternal and child health, the G7 countries, they took bold measures and they put global fund you know, for HIV TB malaria, which shifted the whole thing. They put uh, GFF, you know, for maternal and child health, which really shift everything. But nothing is coming for AMR because exactly. it is about economic interest, political interest, or whatever. So I think that is why we are now very much focused to address this issue. So we have what we call the Global Leaders Group for AMR, which is chaired by the Prime Ministers of Barbados and Bangladesh, which we are supporting as Secretariat. The only focus of that group is really, we know the political uh, determination and commitment. How can we actually make this political commitment into much more concrete you know, action? So they are working on that. They have identified you know, their priorities and the overall objective is to reduce the use of antimicrobials across all sectors, including humans, because in humans, I know, you know, we said from body mass proportion, a lot is used in animals. But when we looked into uh, guidelines, it's only in humans that we don't have anything that probably, you know, regulate the use of antibiotics, antimicrobial. Uh, we have it in, plant, in, in animals, we have it in food sector, but not in humans. So I think there's this political group with that broader vision, they are really trying to concretize you know, all this commitment from G7 and G20. So let's hope, you know, that will bring some concrete, uh, you know, intervention. Apart from this, the communication issue, what is AMR, antimicrobial resistance, you know? We're not talking about humans here, you know? We are not even talking about the bacteria when we call antimicrobial resistance. We are talking something that is caused about around the drugs or this or that, you know, even that communication 
is not you know, clear. And uh, I, I think a year ago, there has been uh, analysis done by the Wellcome Trust really to look you know, into this. How can we address uh, whether you know, super bugs will make you know, a, a good com- way of communication? It's a challenge. But the whole issue is you know, AMR as a branch and with that greater visibility, greater you know, uh, commitment, you know, the message is going to get crystallized. But at this point in time, I'm afraid to say that we don't have the shortcut answer and solution for it. For the communication part. Yeah. Thank you very much. We could stay a few hours here, but I think that the time has ended. So I hand it over to my co-chair, Robert, if you want to close the session. We cannot hear you, Robert, for some reason. No, I can't, I can't, at least, at least I cannot hear you. Uh, nobody. No, he's still muted. Then again, try again. Yeah. No? You're muted, Robert. So I will do it for you. I'm sorry. So I, I take the words for Robert. So first, thank you, uh, Dr. Getahun. Thank you very much for, for attending this session. And thank you very much to all attendants. Um, it's, it's very good to see some of the friends even uh, in the screen, which is not uh, the most appropriate thing, but it, this is what we can do now. And hopefully we will see you all soon. So please follow up our collaboration with WHO. Uh, I'm sure that there will be more news to come and more possibilities for all our members to collaborate and to make proposals and to put together. This is a field for the future. Complex field, as Dr. Getahun explained, but of course it's our role to, to be here and to be helping. Thank you all very much for attending. Thank you, Dr. Getahun. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.